Hello and welcome to this video on childhood, cultural differences, history and changing position. For most of us, we would have enjoyed a modern Western notion of childhood. That is to say that we in the West believe that children are fundamentally different from adults, that they are physically and psychologically immature, they haven't quite grown yet, and they lack the skills and experience necessary to be able to engage in all aspects of society and to really be part of society. Pilcher argues that this is a distinct, separate life stage, which we call childhood, and we do a whole range of different things in the West, everything from um, treating children differently, dressing them differently, expecting them to do different things from adults, that shows that this is a distinct life stage. This differentness of nature is therefore emphasised, as I've said, with different laws for adults and children, different clothes, different entertainment, and so on. Childhood is actually seen in the West as a golden age of innocence. We often believe that children are born uh, without blemish, that they have no mark upon them, that they are not evil, they are not bad, they're completely blank. And it's only as they are socialised, as they are brought up by their parents and by other institutions in society that they become the person they're going to be. And so we often try to preserve that innocence. We try and protect children from knowing perhaps about the not so desirable things that happen in the world in the hope that they can enjoy that innocent age for as long as possible. Stephen Wagg said that childhood is socially constructed and that is not a universal concept, that this is something that we as a society create and that childhood means different things in different parts of the world. We've got a range of different examples of that now here. So firstly, Punch looked at children in Bolivia, and from the age of five years old, these children were taking on work responsibilities in the home and the local community without hesitation. So they would do some shopping, do some cleaning, perhaps help their neighbours and this sort of thing. Lowell Holmes looked at children in Samoa and found that there was no concept of too young in that community or society. So when children were using dangerous tools and carrying heavy loads, parents weren't stopping them doing it. They were saying, well, if you think you can do it, let them do it. And so they did. Raymond Firth looked at some children in the Western Pacific and found that they do not automatically do as adults tell them to do. Instead, the children will listen to what the adults have to say and they take it on board as if it was advice. So if they like what they're being told, they'll do it. If they don't, they'll do their own thing. Finally, Bronislaw Malinowski, also looking in the Southwest Pacific, found that the adults in those communities did not view the sexual activities of young people and children with disdain, but instead tolerated their experimentation. So this is quite different from in the West. If a child was to be seen perhaps masturbating or exploring their sexuality or perhaps even engaging in a sexual act with another child, they would probably be stopped and told off. Whereas Malinowski found in other parts of the world this wasn't the case. Adults were actually quite open-minded and they would allow the children to experience those things as they so desire. This brings us to the work of Philippe Ariès, and he argued that in the Middle Ages, the idea of childhood did not exist. So there hasn't always been a concept of childhood, it's something that's come about, and this lends weight to this idea that childhood is socially constructed. Children were not seen as having different nature or different needs from adults, they were seen as one and the same. Children were essentially mini-adults with the same rights, duties, skills as adults, so they would often be working from a young age, and therefore they would dress the same and do the same things. Children often had to face the same punishments as adults if they broke the law. So there was no let off simply because they were young. Arias came to this conclusion by looking at works of art from the 10th to the 13th centuries and looking at how children were portrayed in them vis a vis adults. Arias points out that the paintings show children as miniature adults. He states that there are no characteristics of childhood shown. Adults and children were dressing the same, playing and working together. So there was no separateness. They essentially were mini adults or little adults. However, there may be some problems with using paintings and diaries as a form of evidence to draw these conclusions. And you may want to pause for a moment now and think about research methods and what those problems might be. Parental attitudes were also different to children in the Middle Ages versus now. So according to Ariès, elements of the modern notion of childhood started to emerge after the 13th century. So schools started to specialise in educating the young. You know, previously, schools were only really available for the richest and most powerful in society. And often people didn't or begin their schooling perhaps a little bit later. They may have some basic schooling maybe by a nanny or some description from a young age, but then they do their real studies when they get a little bit older. Now, of course, in the contemporary world, children are in school from the, from the age of four up until at least 18, in the UK at the very least. Clothing became separate for adults and children, so we started to dress children differently rather than placing them in simply smaller version of adult clothes. 
And finally, child centeredness started to occur. And we actually studied handbooks and uh, other books on child rearing, which became available for parents. So um, we moved from a situation where children were almost on the periphery or just another member of society to a point where now children are the centre of the family and the centre of society, hence child centeredness. According to Arias, these developments culminate in the modern cults of childhood. So it has been argued by some sociologists today that childhood is almost seen as this beautiful, precious, important thing, and it almost comes before everything, hence child centeredness. He argues that we have moved from a world where childhood wasn't seen as special at all to a world obsessed with childhood. And Linda Pollock criticizes Arias, arguing that it's more correct to say that in the Middle Ages, society simply had a different view of childhood. So maybe it's a product of the world that the Middle Ages uh, was, in so much as that there was a lot more disease, there was a lot more hardship, there was a lot more poverty, and so families needed children to grow up quickly and to start earning money and to pay their way, rather than spend their time perhaps playing and learning and exploring as children would perhaps today. There's a whole range of reasons for the changes in the position of children. So ideas about children and their social status have varied over time. There are many reasons for the changes in the position of childhood within society. These include changes during the 19th and 20th century, such as declining family sizes. So um, as family sizes become smaller, parents have more money to spend on less children. So hence child centeredness again. The rise of children's rights. Children did not always have rights, but they were treated the same as adults. Now children have specific rights. Compulsory schooling. Schooling was not always compulsory, and the length of time in which young people stayed at school has increased over time, irreversibly changing the way children are looked at in our society. Children's health. We now have paediatricians whose job is simply to focus on the health of children. Child protection. Very similar to um, the idea of children's rights, we now have child protection units. The police have a whole role to play in protecting children, as do teachers and other institutions within society. Laws and policies, similar as before. Lower infant mortality rates. So families are having less children, partially because they do not need to have more children to replace the dead ones. As dark as that may sound, the reality was lots of people died in infancy, and so families used to have more children. Today, children are far more likely to survive past infancy, and therefore families are having less children. Finally, child labour laws. So now we essentially have a situation where children don't work at all, up until maybe the age of 14, 15, where, where they may get a small part-time job. But the amount of hours they can do is highly restricted until they become an adult. So there's interesting debates about whether or not the position of children has improved. There's two views here. Firstly, the march of progress view. These sociologists claim that the position of children in Western societies has been steadily improving over time. That today's children are more valued, better cared for, protected and educated than ever before. And they point to things such as legislation, the role of specialists, i.e. paediatricians and professional teachers, and increased government spending on children as an example of this. Of course, there's got to be a stark comparison here with children in other parts of the world that aren't in the West, where perhaps we haven't seen quite the jump or the leap forward in terms of the way they are treated and looked after and cared for, although improvements have nonetheless happened you know, versus what was it like in the past. We can also say that the cost of raising a child has um, increased and families are now more willing to spend more money on children. This has led to the rise of the child-centred family and indeed the child-centred society. Whereas conflict view sociologists would say that society is based on conflict between social classes, social groups and genders, that some groups are empowered and other groups are underpowered, and that powerful groups dominate powerless groups. What we find here is that actually children, they would argue, are an unempowered group. They don't have the money, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the skills, they don't have the power to you know, essentially shape their own life and do their own thing. Instead, they are completely in the thrall of their parents or their guardians. March of Progress view, sociology is therefore idealised. It has an idealised view of childhood, makes it seem fantastic and beautiful and wonderful, when actually that's problematic because there are inequalities. And if you're a middle class child versus a working class child, if you're a white child versus perhaps a black Asian minority ethnic child, if you are a female child versus a male child, there's going to be differences in terms of how much fun, enjoyment and care you receive. That is the reality of our society, conflict view sociologists would claim. So again, just to reiterate, we need to think about inequalities among children. Not all children have the same life experiences or opportunities. 
So if you think about your nationality, where you are born will affect your life experience. If you're born in the UK versus if you're born in, say, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you're going to have very different experiences of childhood. Your gender. Little boys and little girls are socialised differently. Arguably, in a patriarchal society, little boys are being socialised to be dominant over women in our society, and that's going to be problematic if you are a little girl. In terms of ethnicity, little girls from Asian families are expected to obey their parents and be submissive, whilst little boys are expected to study hard and excel at school. That's just one example of the differences you might get between boys and girls or between different ethnicities. In the UK alone, there's obviously lots of different ethnic groups, and the way they socialise children and treat children will be different. It's the nature of their culture. Finally, social class. So working class children and middle class children are going to have very different experiences and very different opportunities available to them when it comes to achieving, not just in school, but in life in general. Put it all together, what have you got? Children are simply not all equal. Some are more equal than others, if you would. That's it. Thank you very much.